And we think that uh, Honduras has taken uh, important and necessary steps uh, that uh, deserve the recognition and the normalization of relations. Uh, I have just sent a letter to the Congress of the United States notifying them that we will be restoring aid to Honduras. Uh, other countries in the region uh, say that uh, you know they want to wait a while. Uh, I don't know what they're waiting for, but that's their right to wait. We're coming out of a coup that we can't put behind us. We can't reverse it. It just kept going. And after, there was the issue of the elections. The same Hillary Clinton, in her book, Hard Choices, practically said what was going to happen in Honduras. This demonstrates the meddling of North Americans in our country. The return of the president, Mel Zelaya, became a secondary issue. There were going to be elections in Honduras. And he or she, Clinton, recognized that they didn't permit Mel Zelaya's return to the presidency. There were going to be elections. And the international community, officials, the government, the grand majority accepted this, even though we warned this was going to be very dangerous and that it would permit a barbarity, not only in Honduras, but in the rest of the continent. And we've been witnesses to this. Hello, everyone. The first clip you heard there was of Hillary Clinton justifying her actions concerning the 2009 Honduran military coup that ousted President Manuel Zelaya. The second voice was environmental activist Berta Cáceres, talking of witnessing a barbarity descend upon Honduras and the rest of the continent as a result of this coup. Not long after making these comments, Miss Cáceres was murdered by assassins trained at the United States' infamous School of the Americas, acting on behalf of the energy company DESA. To examine the origins of the US relationship with Honduras, we'll need to go back a hundred years, once more to the presidency of William Howard Taft. Honduras declared independence from Spain in 1821, adopting a highly dysfunctional democratic model of government where coups were commonplace. By the turn of the 20th century, and much as with Nicaragua, American corporations were consolidating large land holdings in the country. They lobbied the US government to protect their investments as they ran into conflict over issues such as peasants' rights. The first US military incursion took place in 1903, and they occurred consistently over the succeeding decades. Because the country was effectively controlled by American fruit corporations, it was the original inspiration for the term Banana Republic. To give a sense of the importance of bananas, Prior to 1870, the fruit, or herb, depending on who you listen to, was virtually unknown in the United States. By the turn of the 20th century, Americans were consuming over 16 million bunches a year. One of the titans of this industry was Samuel Sam the Banana Man, Zemery. Zemery arrived in the United States a penniless immigrant in 1891 and proceeded to make a fortune by improving on banana distribution methods. Zemery disliked Honduran President Miguel de Vila. De Vila insisted on American businessmen paying taxes and abiding by laws and regulations. He was also campaigning to limit the amount of land foreigners could own in Honduras. Zemery, along with other opponents, initiated a failed coup attempt to overthrow de Vila in 1908. De Vila then granted a railroad concession to one of Zemery's competitors, leading to another coup effort. For this one, Zemery hired privateers, including such colourful sounding characters as Lee Christmas and the notorious New Orleans gangster George Machine Gun Maloney. The mercenaries initially took control of the small Honduran island of Utila, about 20 miles off the coast. They then sailed to and seized the port of Trujillo. At this point, they were detained by an American gunboat for violating US neutrality laws. At this time, the United States government also had issues with President de Vila. Honduras was in substantial debt to British banks. President Taft disapproved of this and thought such debt contributed to Honduran instability. The US government requested de Vila transfer Honduras's debt to the American banking firm J.P. Morgan. To guarantee repayment, Morgan would take control of the Honduran railroad and manage its customs and treasury, effectively turning the country into a protectorate. This was, understandably, not popular in Honduras and de Vila could not have gotten support for such an agreement. The arrival of mercenaries on Honduran shores, however, must have convinced him there was no other choice, as the Americans were seeking his overthrow. Lee Christmas then convinced Captain George Cooper, the officer detaining him, 
that his band of mercenaries were acting with approval from Washington. Cooper contacted the State Department to confirm and received no reply. He took this to be diplomatic code. The department had not contradicted Christmas's claims, but neither had they implicated themselves by confirming them. Cooper then released the mercenaries and contacted the local army commander to declare the nearby town a neutral zone, ensuring they would be unable to utilize their defensive positions. Doing so would have drawn the US Navy into the fight. The town fell to the onslaught of hundreds of mercenaries. Davila, unable to get the Bankers' Treaty passed the Honduran legislature, offered to step down. The United States then issued an order forbidding any more fighting in Honduras, meaning that Davila could no longer use his army. US Marines landed and forced both sides to negotiate. Zemri had chosen previous president, Manuel Bonilla, as a figurehead to justify military action. The Honduran government agreed to a new provisional president to be selected by the United States. The following year, Zemery's man was elected president once more. President Bonilla proceeded to award Zemery 20,000 hectares of banana growing land. He granted him a permit to make imports duty free and gifted him half a million dollars to cover his costs in organizing the coup. Zemery became known as the uncrowned king of Central America and continued to wield influence on in Honduras over the decades to come, securing exclusive lumbering rights to a region covering one tenth of the country's territory. We will return to look at him again later in this series, when he pulls similar tricks in 1950s Guatemala, this time backed by a new agency dedicated to supporting US corporate interests abroad, the CIA. As the labor movements emerged in Honduras to push back against the banana companies, strikes were put down by the Honduran military with support from the US Navy when necessary. The US also periodically intervened due to the enormous amounts of coups in the country. Just after the Second World War, the US Army founded the institution most famously known as the School of the Americas. Over the following decades, the school trained tens of thousands of Latin American army officers, including around three and a half thousand in Honduras. Officers were trained in such activities as kidnapping, extortion, torture and assassination. The idea was to take a hands-off approach to controlling Latin America by facilitating their own militaries in doing the dirty work. There were two aspects to this, propping up despotic regimes by liquidating opposition, and also removing governments not conducive to US interests. I'll play some clips from the 2003 documentary, Hidden in Plain Sight, The School of the Americas, to give you a better sense of it. Originally, the School of the Americas was founded because uh, so many of the Central and South American nations uh, were uh, dictatorships. Uh, they were having coups, and there was a lack of democracy all through Central and South America. As a result, we have uh, every country in Central and South America being a democracy with the uh, exception of Cuba, uh, which of course does not send students to the School of Americas. I know a lot of people do not know about the School of the Americas and what it stands for. And people here, I found out, believe that we are protecting democracy and promoting democracy, and that's not what we have done for the last 50 years. Founded in Panama in 1946, the School of the Americas trained American soldiers in jungle warfare and counterinsurgency tactics so they could more effectively protect and expand U.S. political, economic, and strategic interest in Latin America. The goal of post-World War II U.S. foreign policy was expressed by George Kennan, who said, quote, We, the United States, represent only 6.3% of the world's population, but we control 50 to 60% of the world's resources. Our responsibility in this new era must be to maintain the disparity, unquote. Part of this responsibility was assigned to the Latin American military and police. In the 1950s, the School of the Americas was transformed into a training center for Latin Americans, with all courses conducted in Spanish. Then came the Cuban Revolution of 1959. 
an alarmed Kennedy administration responded by mandating the SOA to play a leading role in suppressing Cuban-inspired wars of national liberation in the Western Hemisphere. In 1962, the uh, Kennedy administration shifted the mission of the Latin American military uh, from uh, hemispheric defense to internal security. Uh, internal security, it means war against the population. The, the internal security doctrine meant uh, that the mass of the population must be disciplined, uh, depoliticized, marginalized, and suppressed in the interests of elite groups. The head of counterinsurgency during the uh, uh, Kennedy years, uh, Charles Machling, pointed out that uh, the effect of this doctrine was to turn the Latin American military into something that resembled uh, uh, the uh, SS troops of Himmler. As the SOA carried out its counterinsurgency or anti-guerrilla campaign, Latin Americans began calling it the school of coups, the school of assassins, and the school for dictators. The school of the Americas is one of many instruments which the United States uses to impose the status quo upon other countries using force and violence. The important question is, why would U.S. leaders be doing that sort of thing? They say they do it for democracy, to fight communism, uh, to stop terrorism, to secure American lives, or to defend American interests. Now, when they say defending American interests, they're getting a little closer to the truth. But whose American interests? Not the interests of me or you or the taxpayer. It's the interests of large corporate investors. <laughs> So the goal, and this is seen in the kinds of countries and regimes they support and in the kinds that they attack, the goal is very rational and very persistent and very consistent. And it is to make the world safe for that one or two percent at the top who own most of the world. The first beneficiaries of a country's resources, human and material, must be what's called U.S. interest. And if uh, uh, people in the country think the first beneficiaries should be the people of that country, well, they're known communist proponents, and you've got to do something about them. Uh, what you do about them is you know, a lot of things, but if nothing else works, you kill them. I think that the School of the Americas reminds people in a very blunt way that Americans, too, can be collectively responsible for torture, for murder, for dictatorship and not just for defending these things or covering them up or being complicit with them but actually teaching people how to do them uh, which is more than complicity uh, it's direct responsibility and of course you, one would expect there would have to be an HQ of it somewhere it's not paranoid to think that a policy that relied so much upon repression would need a training school there'd have to be one and now we know where it is and the extraordinary thing is the astonishing thing is that everybody knows where it is, and it's still there. In other words, it's, you, would, you would have hoped that an attempt would be made to keep such an institution secret, if only out of embarrassment. But no, uh, the decision is to flaunt it, say, yeah, you bet we do this. You bet we do. A manual on interrogation and on torture was published by the School of the Americas. A manual on sabotage and assassination and the recruiting of criminal elements for counter-revolution was published and distributed in the case of Nicaragua by the US government. Uh, they openly said what it was they hoped to do. Um, the Guatemalan death squads uh, have said, and all the evidence that has been uh, uncovered in Guatemala proves that they didn't make a move without running it by the local CIA station chief. He didn't just know who the torturers were. He picked them and trained them. The striking thing as ever is that the dirty secret is not a dirty secret, it's hidden in plain sight. They almost boast about it, and in a way, that's part of the operation, I think. It's supposed to frighten people, it's supposed to be terroristic, it's supposed to let people know, yeah, we will come and get you, we will cut off your face, we will make your children disappear, or have them tortured in front of your wife. All of that we will do, we know how.
This is not a monastery, a seminary, a peace academy. This is a combat school. And that's why they're coming here, to get those skills. And they're going back to defend that system. Who's the enemy? They're the poor. They are, they are who they've always been. Where's the enemy located outside of the borders of their countries? No, no. They're within their borders. They are the poor who threaten the army, who threaten that socioeconomic system there, who call for reform, just wages, adequate housing, schools, hospitals. During the 1980s, with the loss of Nicaragua to the leftist Sandinistas and active guerrilla movements in El Salvador and Guatemala, Honduras became a stable base of operations for the United States in Central America. Ronald Reagan increased military assistance from $4 million in 1981 to $77 million by 1984. The operations centered there killed tens of thousands outside of the country, whilst internally any dissent was squashed by the infamous Battalion 316. This military unit, containing many members trained at the School of the Americas, worked closely with the CIA to abduct, torture and execute hundreds of suspected dissidents. One State Department official later acknowledged that there was a green light on killing commies. As I mentioned in the previous episode, the war on Nicaragua wound down in 1988. Counter-revolutionary armies stopped operating out of Honduras, and a civilian government sought to rein in the military. By the 90s there were calls to pursue those responsible for the human rights abuses of just a few years prior. Battalion 316 didn't go away, however. They simply integrated into the police and government. In 2009, many former members initiated a coup against President Manuel Zelaya, ultimately deporting him to Costa Rica. This was sparked after Zelaya called for a constitutional referendum which would have allowed a president to serve more than one term. Whilst this is of course a standard dictator move, it actually would not have affected Zelaya himself, as his term was close to ending. The one term limit was also a way the Honduran military prevented the civilian governments from becoming too powerful. Constitutional reform would have had further implications, potentially weakening the power of the military and threatening the massive US military base in the country. It's likely these were the real reasons for the coup. Zelaya contended that the United States was involved in his removal. No direct evidence of that has emerged, but with many of the coup plotters being graduates of the School of the Americas, it's questionable whether there exists a meaningful distinction. The coup leader, General Romeo Vasquez Velequez, was himself a graduate of the school. And this brings us back to the opening clip. Then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton essentially supported the coup by not condemning it and instead calling for new elections, which led to Salela's political opponents coming to power. It's widely acknowledged that these elections were marred by corruption and violence. The Organization of American States drafted a resolution that would have refused to recognize Honduran elections carried out under the military dictatorship, but the State Department blocked its adoption. Clinton justified this by implying Zelaya was a budding tyrant and opposing the coup could have sparked a civil war. Honduras sank back into the darkness of the 1980s. The homicide rate shot up and the murder of opposition political candidates and activists became normal. This is the barbarity Berta Cáceres spoke of prior to her own murder. The United States have fully supported the Honduran military and police throughout. This sparked the Honduran refugee crisis, with hundreds of thousands of people fleeing the country and ending up on the US border. The major factor in this is the chaos brought about by narcotics trafficking. This isn't a separate issue, however. Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez has been implicated in the drugs trade, with his brother currently serving a life sentence in the United States. Honduras has become a narco state. Ironically, the refugee crisis is one of the major issues that lost Hillary Clinton the election to Donald Trump in 2016. To end on what is possibly a positive note, right now is an interesting time in Honduras. In January of 2022, the wife of deposed president Manuel Zelaya, Ziamara Castro, won an election to herself become president. We can hear on Democracy Now! what it's hoped this will herald for the country. 
We begin today's show in Honduras, where leftist presidential candidate Xiomara Castro appears poised to become the country's first woman president, putting an end to over a decade of right-wing neoliberal rule. While the official vote count has not been released, Castro holds a commanding lead over Nasri Asfura of the right-wing National Party, which has ruled Honduras for 12 years following the 2009 U.S.-backed coup, which ousted Castro's husband, Manuel Mel Zelaya. Xiomara Castro claimed victory Sunday night. Vamos. We are going to build a new era, out with the death squads, out with corruption, out with drug trafficking and organized crime, no more poverty and misery, to victory. The people will always be united. Together, we are going to transform this country. Xiomara Castro's apparent victory in Honduras is seen as a blow to Washington, which has embraced successive right-wing governments despite widespread accusations that Honduras has become a narco-military regime. Thank you for listening. In this episode, I've again drawn on Stephen Kinzer's book, Overthrow. I've also drawn on the documentary film Hidden in Plain Sight, The School of the Americas, as well as several articles I'll link to. This concludes season one of the Energy of Empire series. I've covered the United States overseas imperial expansion during the years 1893 to 1912. We've seen the states assert various degrees of control over Hawaii, Guam, the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Panama, Nicaragua, and Honduras. And we've looked at how this system of control persists to the current day. In the next season, I'm going to look at the run in to World War I, the change in the nature of imperialism under Woodrow Wilson, and I might start by hopping across the Atlantic to examine the concept of an Anglo-American establishment. Finally, I'd like to let you know that a book version of the Essence of Anarchy and Contemplating Conspiracy series are now available and I'll link to them below. Thanks again for listening. Qué lindo nombre, señores, el de esta Honduras sin igual. Ella es mi patria querida y también fue de Morazán. Tiene su virgen morena, la cual venimos toditos a adorar. Por eso quiero que sepan Y aquí también sabemos cantar. Ay, qué orgullo tengo yo de haber nacido aquí en esta tierra linda. Y por ella moriré si me toca pelear. Yo siempre triunfaré.